The Fed should definitely cut after game-changing June CPI data. Of finance at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, chief economist at Wisdom Tree, Jeremy, uh, Professor, it's good to see you. You said that uh, that you we won't see a rotation into small stocks stocks until uh, it becomes clear the Fed's going to cut and that the CPI said this before it came out could be a game changer. That's exactly what happened. You saw what happened with the Russell yesterday. Now, what is this? Uh, three steps forward, two steps back. What, what did the PPI say to you? Well, I, I, I think it's four steps forward and maybe one step back. Uh, there's a few components here that do go into the PCE and it's going to take a little while to to suss that out. But I, I, I think that the CPI was a game changer. And yeah, I mean, it was last Friday uh, for Scott Wapner uh, closing bell that exactly what I said. And I, I think the Fed should definitely cut. Uh, I mean, not only was it great inflation news on the CPI, which is far more important than, than, than the PPI, but uh, let's look at jobless claims. Now, it, jobless claims were good this week, but don't forget they reported the week of July 4th, which, uh, you know, uh, is, is always distorted. I'm really looking at it next week because we've been on an upward trend, uh, not only on claims, we've been on an upward trend on the unemployment rate. Um, you know, when we hit uh, 4.1%, we hit the so-called SOM rule, which says that if the three-month moving average goes up uh, a half a percent, which it did on the last labor report, the probability of recession is very high. Now, I'm not calling for recession, but I'm saying that that is on the Fed's radar. So I'm looking at that. Uh, I think he's teeing up a cut. Um, I'm just hoping that he'll cut fast enough uh, that he won't go too slow on the way down uh, the way we know he went far too slow on the way up. So Yeah, let me give you guys the uh, bear case in terms of you know, recession's basically a guarantee. Big recession, unemployment cycle, basically a guarantee at this point in time. So let me let me put together that, that case for you here, okay? So if I was to put that case together for you, I would point out the inflation cycle we went through over the past few years, right? Uh, we're going through it, you know, things getting worse, worse, worse. Finally, the Fed takes it serious. They start obviously raising interest rates. And how long did it take for the Fed to raise interest rates to really start bringing down CPI to levels that you would want it at? It took years, right? Several years. So let's play this game the other way. Okay, now unemployment's starting to rise, right? We could be going into an unemployment cycle. We could be going into problems uh, in regards to the employment market, right? Well, the Fed's going to eventually start cutting here, I don't know, September, November. There's debate about what month it's going to be, right? Okay, they start cutting. But it's going to likely take a year, if not several years, of the Fed cutting to get down to a place where it starts to positively affect the employment market again, right, in any substantial way. So likely, you know, there's a pretty high probability you get an un in unemployment cycle in there, right, where unemployment goes to at least 5 6%, if not you know, seven, eight, nine percent, ten percent, something like that, right? So that's a little food for thought in regards to that. It's no bueno, it's no fun, right? But yeah, the problem is when the Fed starts cutting, unless it's an emergency, they'll cut probably like 25 basis points at a time, maybe 50 basis points at a time, which if you're gonna take those little small steps here and there, you know, shoot, you know. <laughs> Fed lags. If you want on playing any game, whether you're trying to help employment or whether you're trying to bring down inflation, there's Fed lags. And the Fed lags, as we know, is usually one to three years. So from the time the Fed starts cutting, let's say they, they start cutting September of this year, in order to start helping out the employment market or the economy, it's going to take likely a minimum of one year to even start to see anything, but likely closer to two to three years, right? Which then you're all the way out, all the way, you're all the way out in 2026 at that point in time, right? Before you really start to positively affect things. Uh, my concern is not that he's going to, you know, cut too much, but he he might cut too slowly. But the data will tell us what what the judgment is. You don't think before September? <laughs> no, unless we get a big deterioration. I mean, I'm trying to think that July 31st is the meeting, so uh, we get uh, maybe one, two. Uh, jobless claims, no other really important indicator. So, no, he's far too deliberate, but it'll be a tee up. Uh, I think, you know, saying we, we now see the conditions in place 
for a cut if the data continue to move in the direction that we are seeing at the current time. Um, right. Of course, the cut is expected to be 25 basis points, but yeah. be, you know there's six weeks until that next meeting, and we'll see whether uh, he is compelled to do more at that time. But that's my expectation for the July 31st yeah. meeting. <clears throat> so not. Now, I could also we could also play a game of what is worse. Is an unemployment cycle worse? Let's say unemployment goes to six, eight, nine percent, right? Or is an inflation cycle worse, where in CPI goes to six, eight, nine percent, right? What's worse out of those two situations? Well, a lot of people could argue that an inflation cycle is far worse than actually an unemployment cycle. So if you had to pick CPI go to eight percent or unemployment go to eight percent, some people would make a case that it's actually better to have unemployment go to 8% than CPI go to 8%. And the reason being essentially is, okay, unemployment goes to 8%. That that hurts a much smaller segment of the overall population. If CPI goes to 8%, that hurts everybody. Everybody is hit by that, right? And so that's why some will make an argument that what we've actually been through over the past few years is worse than an unemployment cycle, right? And so, I mean, I think there's cases to be made for both because at the end of the day, if unemployment's in a higher place, let's say, for instance, right, well, that's less spending in the economy. That could hurt businesses. That can hurt uh, people that might count on bonuses and tips and all those sorts of things, right? So I think there's arguments to be made by both, but I can definitely see the case that inflation hurts more than an unemployment cycle. I really can see that. And I'll also say it's easier for the Fed to cut rates to zero and flood the money, flood flood the system with money, than to bring down inflation. In to bring down inflation because it gets embedded, much more difficult. So hmm, yeah, I could see why you know I could definitely see why you know there's people that believe that inflation cycle is is worse than unemployment cycle. Inflation, but suddenly the uh, what we're seeing in the, down the economy market. because it looks like this this half is. Going at less than two percent. Yeah, you know, we were originally excited about you know last year way above expectations. We uh, the Fed expected over two percent for twenty twenty four. Well, the first half is looks like under two percent, and uh, you know that's below Fed target. So uh, there's there's many many reasons. He himself said, "Don't go. We're not going down to two. Waiting for the." You know, CPI to go down to two before we cut that far, far too late. Yeah, uh, so what was really it. encouraging, finally, that rental component, which, you know, I've talked about so often, is so mm. lagged in the CPI, finally started coming in lower. And uh, hopefully that'll continue yeah. to happen in coming months to keep that uh, CPI rate uh, in line. So the other mandate's now just as important. It used to be inflation. Now you got to look at both and the claims. Uh, number is one way to see it uh, every week. The, re the rotation we saw yesterday, does that continue? You think the NASDAQ is ready for a breather? Do you think uh, you're going to see a move into this, uh, 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 the breath will improve, smaller yeah. uh, company stocks will go up, value will go up now? That, that was the beginning of something yesterday? It, it, uh, you know, and the reason is, is that small firms are, are so much more sensitive to the short-term interest rate, which the Fed sets. Um, you know, they, the, the, you know, it used to be called LIBOR, now it's called SOFR. They, they pay the short rate plus uh, 200 basis points and all their inventories, a lot of their borrowings are due to that. A lot of the big companies, you know, either pay through equity or, or fixed in long rates long time ago. It's those firms are going to be the most help by lowering interest rates to the Fed. And I think that's what stock pickers saw yesterday. And, uh, you know, unless we get, you know, some, you know, bad news to the contrary on inflation or too fast uh, an economy, uh, you know, that it could be that yesterday marks a shift finally uh, in uh, the big tech stocks versus the rest of the market. I mean, I've never seen anything with 400 stocks go up in the S&P and the S&P goes down. Um, that, that, that's that's yeah. something that uh, you don't see very often. If ever. Now, uh, let me answer this question, okay? What's worse for the stock market? 
a 7% CPI, super high CPI, or 7% unemployment rate, super high unemployment rate, let's say, for instance, right? I can tell you the unemployment going to 7% far worse for the stock market than CPI going to 7%. And the reason being is if there's that much inflation in the system, companies are going to be able to go up on price likely substantially in regards to their products, which is going to help kind of offset the business, at least to a certain extent, right? Maybe not the full way, but to at least a certain extent, it also helps their revenues go higher, right? Of course, what they pay for the inputs of their products is also going to go higher. So that's kind of an issue. And that's why a lot of times SaaS companies are really seen as a holy grail because they don't have to deal with the worry about what's the price of gas and what's the price of, uh, you know, this piece of steel over here and what's the cost of, of labor and whatnot. Um, so that's why SaaS companies are kind of seen as a holy grail. Now, an unemployment cycle, very, very devastating to a lot of companies because then companies could have actually deflation in regards to their products, which then means their margins could actually go down in the short term. Additionally, if a lot more people are unemployed, there's a lot less money out there, right? A lot less money out there to be spent. And so that definitely hits companies' earnings. You can see that clearly if you look back at companies' earnings, you know, from the second half of 2008 through, you know, basically the first half, if not the first three quarters of 2009, a lot of companies, I mean, it was just a whole host of companies that revenues basically went negative in that particular time for about a year, year and a half there, right? So overall, and then a lot of companies just weak earnings in 2010 as well. Overall, I will say, yeah, an unemployment cycle is worse for the stock market than an inflation cycle. The only way I could see an inflation cycle being worse for the stock market is if inflation, if Fed funds rate was already high going into it. So let's say before the big inflation cycle, Fed funds rate was already 5.5, for instance, right? And then you get a big uh, inflation cycle, and next thing you know, the Fed has to raise interest rates to 9, 10%. That would be a different situation because then I think you would just see a mass exodus of people investing in the market and say, shoot, if I can get 9% on a treasury, I'm going 9% treasury. This recent cycle going to the fives for treasuries, right? It attracted some money, certainly, but it wasn't like crazy because still a lot of people look at it and they think like everybody's got a program in their head, 8% a year in the S&P 500, right? And then you think, okay, 5%, 5.5%, whatever, 5.3% in a treasury, well, still better in the S&P 500, right? So you have to kind of get above the 8% number to really make a lot of people say, you know what, I'm out of the stock market, I'm into uh, treasuries, right? So, you know, a little food for thought in regards to that. Hey there, it's Jeremy. I hope you really enjoyed that clip here today. What I'm showing you right now is 1000xstocks.com. This is a specific software that has been designed to save you time. It's a one-stop shop for long-term investors to know how the company is doing, listen to what management has planned for the future, and compare companies next to each other. Which big tech is the most undervalued? Is that small cap company you heard of actually worth investing in? Or their red flags. Get the front row to the conference call, be able to access the management, which information is right to make an educated decision. Get all that information through 1000xstocks.com. You can access that through the description area. You can apply for access to 1000xstocks.com or you can go to 1000xstocks.com. Let's react to some videos. And Ed Yardeni, Ed, great to have you back. Um, took Thanks, note Carl. of your your note last week where you went to 5,800. You used the word melt up. Uh, has yep. any of that changed? Not really, no. Um, certainly looks as though we have not just a melt up, but a broadening melt up. Uh, that's different from what we had in the late 1990s. In the late 1990s, we had a melt up which stayed very, very concentrated in technology, particularly large cap technology. This time around, uh, the melt up that we've seen in technology and communication services, at least in the past week, as you folks have noted, uh, seems to be broadening out uh, to the mid caps, the small and large, uh, small and mid cap uh, uh, companies. And I think Don was very uh, accurate in pointing out that um, it has been uh, some short covering and certainly a cut. If anybody's brave enough, if anybody's brave enough, let me know how much you're down today in the comments section. If you're brave enough, go ahead and leave it down there. Down 1K today, down 5K, down 50 grand. Whenever you're down, 
If you're brave enough, let me know in the comments. It makes us all feel better. That's why I love to show lo big losses on day like today, right? Because it makes everybody feel better. I actually see a lot of comments sometimes like, oh, it makes me feel good when you post, you know, losses like this. So, you know, other people are going through it as well, right? In regards to downward day. ...in biotech and in uh, re regional banks. So it is, it's widened out. I think the widening out, though, uh, is going to increasingly focus on the S&P 473. In other words, uh, money may continue to come out of the Magnificent Seven or money won't go into the Magnificent Seven and will get uh, redistributed uh, to the rest of the S&P 500. The problem with the smith caps is uh, earnings. The earnings still are pretty punk. Uh, they've been kind of flat for them. So the, the issue with that thought process, I've got to be honest with you guys, there is an issue with it. This thought process of like money floods out of these stocks, goes into these stocks, you know, out of the large, into the small. There is an issue with this, okay? The issue is that only is true for really actively managed money. And keep in mind, actively managed money nowadays can be a much smaller amount. Much of the money in the market is passively invested. We could call it not the most intelligently invested, if we want to put it that way, right? Passive investing is I'm just putting in an index fund, right? And I don't know how to do anything, and so it just goes into the biggest stocks. And the biggest stocks that are the biggest get even more money, right? Sounds a little bit like Ponzi. No, 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 no. Just kidding, okay? But in all seriousness, it's not, it, it's not ideal from a lot of different reasons. It can make the top of the market much more overvalued than it should be. <clears throat> Companies that maybe deserve to have higher multiples maybe don't get that because they're lower down the totem pole because so much money is just going into, I don't know what to do. So they just go to the top, right? It just funnels to the top. And it will, you know, there will be obviously a day of reckoning when it comes to that eventually. Um, when that day comes, well, it remains to be seen, but it, it will come crumbling down. And, and that's going to be an interesting moment because I think there's going to be a lot of people, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be questioned passively, managed money, right? I shouldn't even say managed money, just passively invested money. But until that moment, a lot of people kind of gravitate toward that thought process of like, uh, I don't know what to do. So just put it in the biggest stocks, you know, at the top of the market. I don't know. I don't care that they're super overvalued. Like I'm just going to buy those stocks. And so that's a kind of phenomenon you have going on. Whenever the market does break for real, for real. And when I say break, I'm not talking about all oh, the market went down for a week, a day, uh, you know, a month, something like that. I'm talking about the markets down for a couple of years and down in a substantial way. When that happens, you're going to have a lot of people questioning about, you know, kind of passive investing at that point in time. So, yeah, I wish I could say all this money is going to rotate from these big guys to these small guys, but it's only going to happen for that actively managed money. So much of the money in the market is passively invested. So just a food for thought. Two years. Exactly. And you, you did say last week that you were wary of Fed rate cuts because of yeah. the sideline cash that it would draw into equities. Explain right. that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not in charge of the Fed, and I rarely uh, go out of my way to tell the Fed what to do. But uh, oh, look at this. Uh, as a strategy. Oh, look at this. Just have a look at this, right? Look at that. Look at the stocks that are actually green today, which there's not a lot, right? You know, you got Honest, a small cap, massive move up here today. Planets up, micro cap. Avance up, micro cap. Uh, Fubo's up, small cap. SoFi's up, you know, some people might put into more mid cap. I consider anything under 10 billion nowadays in the market, a small cap. SoFi would fit into the small cap category, right? Revolve, small cap. So you're really looking and it's like the ones that are green are actually really like the small caps. And then, the, you know, a lot of the bigger dogs are just absolutely red dead redemption out there here today, right? So... You know, in terms of the actively managed money, it's certainly still flowing that way and probably will continue to, but we got to once again understand a lot of the money in the market is not actively managed. By the way, if you're confused at all what actively managed means, that means somebody's actually making decisions about, you know what, I'm going to sell out a meta stock and I'm going to go buy, um, you know, whatever stock, Estee Lauder, okay? Oh, I'm going to go buy McDonald's with that money. Oh, I'm going to get out of Wells Fargo and position over to JP Morgan. That's actively managed money. They're actively making moves out there. Passive investing is just like, here, the money's just going to these certain stocks. There's 6% of their money's going to this stock, 4%'s here, and kind of like this set parameters there. I think that uh, if the Fed moves forward here on lowering interest rates, and it looks like it's locked itself into that uh, pattern. Uh, it looks oh, like honest, they're pretty much more. committed wow. uh, to cutting uh, rates in September. I mean, the markets will be totally blown away if they don't. 
because now the expectation is of 100 percent that there's going to be a 25 basis point cut in September. So that's in there. And that certainly explains this melt up. And now this brought. So honest, uh, it kind of had a flirt with going to the fives back in March. Right. And then it kind of had a downfall and then it's back up on an uptrend again. So this time it won't flirt. It will go over five once again if earnings are actually really good and the guidance is really good out of the management team. And if it sound, especially if we get any clarity about the company being profitable and staying profitable. If the company, I mean, I'll just, I'll just be honest with you guys. If, if Carly was to come out and basically say the company's profitable, we're going to stay profitable. You know, we're expected to be profitable every quarter. Gap net income for here, on, you know, for here on out, basically, or for the remainder of this year, or whatever. I mean, stocks going to five plus just in that situation alone. So, you know, the upward momentum is pretty fun as long as things go right. Right? If she, if that wasn't the situation, or they lost a bunch of money or something, that's a whole different ball game there. But if things keep on this up and up. Five. What we're seeing the market. I just don't want to see a month up because the problem is as investment strategist. Then I got to be smart enough to tell everybody when to get out, when it's about to melt down. I much prefer civilized, gradual bull markets. Down. But hey, look, it's it's not what uh, is good for me. It's uh, what the market intends to do. And right now, it feels as though the market is pricing in uh, at least one. Well, actually, the market's pricing in five uh, Fed funds rate cuts of 25 basis points over the next 12 months. That's what it's doing. But, but Ed, there's a difference between broadening and 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 rotating and today it feels like one of those sort of uncomfortable days at least if you're in the nasdaq or any tech stocks which nasdaq's down 2.4 percent the dow is higher so so how do we know which one it is and what's healthier i I think it's broadening i think uh it's it's uh it's healthy to see the the nasdaq have some sort of uh sell-off it's just been going straight up so seeing some profit taking in that uh, index makes sense, especially since there is actually some uh, mildly bearish news, such as, uh, as, as you folks mentioned, uh, that the Biden administration uh, may uh, try to make it even harder uh, for uh, ASML and other semiconductor equipment uh, manufacturers uh, to sell to China. In addition, uh, uh, President, uh, former President Donald Trump is uh, talking about uh, asking the Taiwanese to uh, put the bill for defending them uh, vis-a-vis uh, mainland China. So uh, there's bad news out there. Uh, the market's uh, taking some profits on it. And uh, those profits aren't uh, totally leaving the market. They're quite, quite the opposite. They're going right back in.